Welcome. This is Brian Buchanan and Jean Deschamps from the University of Alberta Department of Critical Care Medicine. This tutorial will review the pitfalls of LVEF assessment in the ICU. As always, you can refer to the Abacus website for particular high yield points on this topic. LVEF assessment is one of the most common reasons for echocardiography in the ICU and the ACCP accordingly highlights it as a core component of basic critical care echocardiography competency. This lecture assumes a degree of comfort in identifying different views necessary for LVEF assessment. This is covered in another tutorial of this video series. The gold standard for LVEF assessment as of now is likely cardiac MRI, but that is also a complicated endeavor for most patients and definitely not applicable in most ICU patients. Visual EF was one of the first methods used and is well validated against other quantitative measures in trained individuals. Really, it's one of the earliest skills learned and latest to be mastered. However, for the purposes of our application, a precise estimate is not critical. Visual estimation relies on two major components, wall thickening and cavity emptying. In visual estimation, the first question is always, are the walls thickening? If some part of the walls are not contracting, this means dysfunction. In most cases, this denotes the possibility of a decreased EF. This is even more clear if all walls are not thickening. Thickening of the wall can be approximated to a biceps contraction from an extended position. The number of fibers are the same, but as the elbow is flexed, they are more compacted and thick. The second question is, are the walls thickening at the same time and towards the middle of the cavity? This is important because if a wall is moving towards the center of the cavity while another one is being moved away, being pushed away, effectively there is no ejection of volume out of the cavity. The cavity is not shrunk, so no volume is left. In these clips, you'll note that the difference between an akinetic wall in the inferior and infralateral regions and a normal wall contraction in the other segments. Note that the cavity still decreases in total volume as the walls are contracting are converging towards the middle of the cavity. As you can see, the akinetic wall remains relatively fixed, but does importantly not move away during the contraction. One thing to remember is that these cavities are bullet-shaped, and thus not every region contributes as much volume injection as others. This is because while the diameter of the cavity may look only slightly bigger in the basal segment, as compared to the apex, the volume is cubed. In a number of instances, the LVF depression might be uniform, but not always, as is shown in the right-sided clip. A quick way to take this into account is to divide a cavity in two halves and estimate the LVEF separately. The top half only contributes one-third of the volume, more or less, while the bottom contributes two-thirds of the volume. As an example, if the apex has an EF of 30% and the base has an EF of 60%, the average would be around 45. However, the base contributes a lot more. Hence, the EF can be edged towards it. It might be closer to the 50-55% mark. The factors that limit visual assessment of LVEF include anatomy and foreshortening, regional motion abnormalities, bundle branch blocks, arrhythmias, tachycardia, the paradigm of ejection fraction versus cardiac output, and, event, and finally, a dilated LV. We're going to talk about anatomy and foreshortening. Foreshortening is the incorrect measure of the left ventricular long axis due to improper sector scan alignment of the left ventricular long axis. Basically, we're not cutting in the right place. The sector scan, instead of cutting across the true long axis of the left ventricle, cuts at an acute angled uh, direction that yields a shorter axis than the true axis length. Um, the bottom right image uh, shows a foreshortening apex and ventricle as compared to the left side. Foreshortening causes significant issues with interpretation of EF, wall motion abnormalities, pericardial effusion interpretation, valvular leaflet assessment. Usually, a foreshortening LV appears to have a better EF than they actually have. To avoid foreshortening, one should always attempt to obtain the longest view of the ventricle and to make sure the apical cap or apex is not moving as you can see on the left clip. The apex should really be the anchor of the heart during an echo assessment, and it should only thicken and not move in space. Its contraction is usually the smallest of all LV segments, and it appears as the thinnest portion of the LV. The right side of the clip, in comparison, shows a moving apex and a thickening apex that changes during every contraction. 
This is not the true apex. Foreshortening is the reason the subcostal four-chamber view can be challenging for LV assessment because it's really impossible to know whether you're catching the longest axis of the LV. Let's explore regional emotion abnormalities. In the following set of clips, you can see here, these are actually all from the same echo, with significant hypokinesis in the anterolateral and infralateral slash septal walls. If you compare them, you'll see the different views appear to have different LV ejection fractions. Specifically, the Paris long axis view on top left has markedly lower LVF compared to the rest of the views. Because of the coronary distribution, normal and kinetic walls can coexist with corresponding apparent variations in ejection fraction. This illustrates that we're using 2D planes to evaluate a 3D structure. As such, a single view can give you gestalt, but may not represent the full picture. The key message is that multiple views should be used to assess the ejection fraction of the LV. A wall motion index scoring has been developed to quantify LV assessment, to, function, to assess the function of every wall and to eventually average them. This method assumes that interact, intact walls cannot overcompensate for dysfunction in other segments. In real life, this is often seen and can lead to significant improvements in near normalization of the LV ejection fraction. The next uh, thing we'll talk about is uh, the role of arrhythmias and tachy and bradycardia in LVEF assessments. Conduction abnormalities can cause significant echo abnormalities as well. Specifically for a left bundle branch block, you can see from the M mode of the LV cavity here uh, that at baseline, both the symptom and inferior wall move at the same time, leading to a visible cavity decrease. In the left bundle branch block image on the right, the septum contracts much before the inferior wall, and it recalls back by the time the posterior wall contracts. This leads to an efficient contraction. Bottom branch blocks can look like septal apokinesis, depressed EF, or in some cases it can make absolutely no changes to the echocardiographic appearance. Additionally, these changes may or may not have any impact on hemodynamics. This is an example of a left bundle branch block tracked by strain to highlight the pattern of contraction. Note how the red, which is contraction, is progressing from the septum on the left to the interolateral wall on the right. This represents left bundle branch block effects on ventricular contraction. In this case, this is likely solely the bundle branch block rather than a hypokinesis of the septum. The key message is to always refer back to the patient's rhythm and QRS when interpreting echo, and that uh, should be looked at on a monitor or on the EKG leads of the patient on the echo machine. Next, move on to arrhythmia and tachycardia. When we talk about irregular electrical activity, which can be seen in, in th items such as atrial fibrillation, we really see irregular atrial and ventricular contraction. This leads to irregular ventricular filling and the strength of the contraction due to the frank starling mechanism. This will show up as a variable EF from beat to beat. In general, LVEF should be assessed based on the contraction that represents the most average beat, or RR interval. However, the best contraction after a long R interval can give you a clue as the potential contractile reserve. Again, looking at the ECG can give you the answer. In some cases, using transmitral Doppler can clarify the diagnosis by highlighting the presence or absence of atrial contraction. In a similar way, tachycardia can actually lead to significant changes in the LV ejection fraction, usually by an apparent decrease. This is because with a high heart rate comes low ventricular filling and short ejection time, reflected as very fast thickening contracting and de-thickening decontracting or relaxing. Often reducing the rate can lead to the normalization of the EF as in this clip of a patient with AVRT that converts back to sinus rhythm. LVF assessment in tachycardia often becomes unreliable above 120 beats per minute. Bradycardia is usually less problematic and often shows up as a supernormal ejection fraction. We'll now talk about the paradigm or the paradox of EF versus cardiac outputs. Key message here is that ejection fraction does not equal cardiac outputs. Context is critical in these situations. These are two cases of IEF. In the case on the left, the cardiac output is very low because of poor preload, with the ventricle squeezing every drop it can out of to the aorta. In the case on the right, the preload and cardiac output are excellent, and the extremely low vascular resistance systemically leads to an easy ejection of the LV. In both cases, the LVF is excellent, but the cardiac output and afterload are widely different. 
Another example is the case of a patient with posterior mitral valve prolapse or a flail posterior mitral leaflet with severe mitral regurge. In this situation, instead of having to eject against the higher pressure of the aorta, the LV is offloaded by an ejection against the lower atrial pressure. This leads to an easier LV contraction and thus a higher LVEF than should, should be present based on cardiac strength. In these clips, the, LV, the EF looks normal, which is not the normal response and denotes either chronic chronicity of the MR or hidden cardiac dysfunction. Another example of the discordance between EF and cardiac output is with severe RV dysfunction, as in this clip. In this clip, the right ventricle is on the left uh, of the screen. The LV is underfilled because of the low cardiac output provided by the RV. In this setting, the underfilled LV is trying to squeeze every drop of blood it is receiving, leading to an extremely good LVEF. Finally, to round this out, we'll talk about the dilated LV, such as what we'll see in dilated cardiomyopathy, multiple wall motion normalities. It can be quite difficult to determine a precise LVEF in this case, particularly as the LVEF becomes significantly depressed. A single segment still functioning well can get the LVEF from 10% up to 20% in slumped cases. For the purposes of CCOS, the precise determination of LVF is usually not necessary. Really, you just want to grossly categorize the function and correspond that to the clinical context of the patient. As you've seen and heard, LV assessment has significant pitfalls that can be avoided if the bedside sonographer is aware of them and takes the clinical picture into context. We'd like to thank you for listening and hope to see you again. Bye for now. Bye for now.